Welcome to Real Estate Radio Live, an informative and engaging podcast discussing everything you need to know about the world of real estate. Your host, Joe Kachera, provides you with insight and guidance on how to buy, sell, finance, and invest in real estate. He also offers real estate tax management strategies, new construction advice, home improvement tips, and much, much more. And now, to guide you around the world of real estate, here's your host and Real Estate Radio Live team leader, Joe Kachera. Welcome in. Good afternoon. Joe Kachera with Real Estate Radio Live. Thank you for those that are uh, joining us live on the Facebook feed today. We appreciate that very much. Our objective is to continue to grow the audience, obviously in many different ways, many different vehicles. The number one way is the podcast. So we do this live show in the live feed. We do interviews and then uh, then it becomes a podcast. So as we continue to do that, uh, we'd love to have you download that podcast. That way you can listen to the show anytime you want at your convenience. You go to iTunes, Google+, Plus. you can go to our website, reradiolive.com. You get that podcast anywhere. Just uh, enter, type in Real Estate Radio Live if you're anywhere on the Internet or Google or iTunes. You'll be able to get that podcast. For the sake of the schedule, we try to keep these shows Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right around 3 o'clock or so Pacific Standard Time. We'll continue to do that. And the objective of the show, if uh, most of you have been following the show, we appreciate that very much for years is education and information. So we try really hard to have great guests like today, regular partnerships with Jack and the rest of the people to pass on great information to you, the consumer, to educate and inform you in many different ways. So we'll continue to do that. We'll get started today. Our topic is uh, funding litigation. So before I um, have Jack give a little minute background on himself, most of you, if you've been following the show, it's been, uh, what, 16, 17 now? Maybe we're up to 18. Yeah. We're Series. We started this several months ago with the goal of starting something new in Silicon Valley, and uh, Jack is an expert in legal background, helps entrepreneurs, startups in many different areas. So we kind of took you through the course, right, Jack? We started people day one. What do you do when you have an idea? How do you protect the idea? How do you fund it? How do you get the right partners? We went through a lot of different right. different series, and today we're going to talk about litigation funding, which is uh, just happens to be in the news a lot lately, well, too. Well, <laughs> it's not only in the news, but it's also something that comes up really in the context of this last series on when the crisis is litigation. We talked about four or five different litigation scenarios that really right. do bring businesses into a crisis mode. Right. And often it's because we never thought at all, we never thought that there would be, yeah, we're doing a little experiment here where we've got a backup Looks iPhone. good. I know. Looks it's like, good. My wife said to me, you know, I said we had some technical problems. She said, bring, just bring an iPhone with a stand and you can do this and Joe won't have to sweat the details. So I said, well, I think Joe thinks the sound quality isn't as good. He said, well, let's experiment. So we got, of course, she's a scientist. We're doing an experiment for her. She's going to watch this tonight. She's going to tell me, you didn't do it the right way or she's going to tell me, great. So it you works. know you're opening up an old can of worms I, I, here, right? No, I know I am, right? You're going to have her critique you now. And then. I do. I let her critique me <laughs> all the time. Good. She does That's say good. often, you know, you were too wordy. And then she says, you didn't explain that well enough. I said, well, which way is this? Am I too wordy or am I too terse? Well, it depends on what Joe's <laughs> question is. Answer the question. Okay, so Joe, your point is, look, we've done this series. And in the series, we get to the easy part in some ways is starting the business. The hard part is getting it off the ground. Very and then true. once it's off the ground... Right. The hardest part is dealing with the inevitable challenges mm -hmm. as the bigger people that you're muscling out, just like Tesla is sort of muscling out the gas car industry, you could argue. You could argue Apple muscled out the mainframe and mini computer people. Mm -hmm. You can argue that all these businesses enter an ecosystem where others are affected then you face the challenges of litigation in one form or another. And we did some examples of that. And the examples that we did included what happens when you have, of course, this is a classic thing. If someone calls you, then <laughs> it blows up your thing. Well, there you go, Joe. You just, we just proved the experiment. There you go. But the point that I'm making is that litigation funding is a whole new, very advanced topic hmm. that changes the way people think about can I survive a litigation? Can mm. I get myself to a point where I can survive? And it's both, by the way, plaintiff's cases as well as defense cases. So mm -hmm. the last series, if you remember, 
we did the crisis is litigation trademark trade name patent trade secret copyright right. intellectual property i don't think we covered unfair competition mm -hmm. but we will but i I think this is very relevant because there is a lot of litigation that but for funding sources just couldn't happen. Mm. And so this is a big, recent, modern topic. And just apropos to this, we had a, a litigation funder come in, a company, I won't mention their name, they didn't pay for the advertising, so <laughs> someday when they do, they said, you know, you're a great law firm, we want to provide you with an umbrella form of funding where we provide your firm with a line of credit, and you could decide what cases you want to take so long as you pay the credit line. Interesting. Think about that. What They must be saying that to every law firm that has any credibility here in the Valley. You could argue that's a bad thing because it's sort of saying to the lawyers, if you think there's right. a case that can be brought, we'll fund it, which historically has not been the way it's worked. Yeah. The way it's worked historically, the client has to come up right. with a fee. right which is a real inertia, because if you say to someone, well, you have real estate, why don't you take a second trustee right. and finance this yourself? They'll look at you like, I got to put my house at risk for the success of this lawsuit. Mm. I don't really want to do that. Mm. And that's a big, you know, people do use real estate to often leverage their startup, but they often don't think I'm going to need to use my real estate to fund litigation. Why don't mm. I find a lawyer that will <clears throat> take it on a contingent fee? And hopefully that lawyer will take more or some of the risk with me. Mm -hmm. So this brings in a third party who's literally in the business of funding either cases or law firms around an outcome where they're going to get more than just an interest charge. So how does, that, get yeah. so how does that work? So you have a third party comes in. Yes. Offer so, that. What what kind of terms? What does that look like for all parties involved? So so it really depends on the nature of the case. But in general, they are looking to get an actual stake. So let's take the simplest version. Okay. You have a collection of IP rights. Let's call them patent rights. But they could be copyright rights, trademark rights, trade secret rights, mm -hmm. collection of rights. Someone's infringed, and you've got a case, but you know it's going to cost at least a hundred thousand dollars of outside expenses to experts, court reporters, transcripts, mm -hmm. all the stuff that's out of pocket money. Okay. hundred thousand dollars. <throat> Probably going to cost a million in legal time, but the lawyers are willing to take the contingency, okay. but they typically won't cover the filing fees and the experts. Those are mm -hmm. cost monies. Okay. These folks will come in and they say, okay, your lawyer is taking 33%. We'll advance a hundred thousand to you if you pay us an interest charge and say seven percent more uh, as a kicker beyond the what would be a typically high interest charge eleven percent twelve percent sometimes fifteen percent mm -hmm. and they'll say, "Look, you should be incentivized to settle the case sooner if you get a reasonable settlement because we'll lower the seven percent hmm. rate." based on when the case settles. So they might say the first kicker is like 1%, and then if the case doesn't settle until seven months later, it goes to 7%. Or sometimes even if it doesn't settle then, it goes to even a higher state. Hmm. So they're obviously money lenders. Right. They're also investors. By mm -hmm. the way, this is non-recourse lending. Oh, okay. All right. This is essentially project lending. Yeah. This is along the lines of you know you have a case, and this could even be a defense case. There actually are scenarios where they'll come in and say, we'll even help fund the defense if you could figure out a way to get us a kicker in whatever that outcome will be, hmm. like a, a potential counterclaim against the other side, a potential stake in a business. Hmm. So think of them as non-traditional lenders. They are essentially coming in, and by the way, there are lots of family offices that are behind folks that are actually running these marketing programs. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. you can think of them as marketing. They're bridging the family offices. These are right. billion-dollar offices that are looking for uncorrelated returns mm. on risky classes of investments. They're not correlated with the stock market, not correlated with oil and gas, not correlated with real estate. It's essentially about, is this a decent case? Is this a decent law firm? Is this a decent party? Mm -hmm. And is this a party that understands they're paying for really expensive money? Yeah, right. But it's at risk. Mm. It's non-recourse. So <clears throat> if you have that case and you are willing to share it, 
so the ideal case is then, you know, I get calls like this all the time. I got a call from, just to give you more of a flavor and example, yeah. from a professor from a well-regarded East Coast school, engineering school. And he said, Mr. Russo, you've been referred to me. I'll leave him in the context yeah. out. Mr. Russo, you've been referred to me. And I got this portfolio of like 100 patents that's being infringed by every uh, one of the companies here in Silicon Valley. I think that it's a $100 million plus hmm. recovery. Would you take my case on a contingent fee? <laughs> of course, you hear that story. You're thinking, hey, this, is, this right. sounds great. So then you say, do you have the money to cover the expenses? Because right. when you have a big set of cases like right. that, particularly a patent case or patent cases, you need expert witnesses. Right. You it's need a real hard costs. A, yeah. it, there's right. real hard money. Right. And he says no. Hmm. Well, you have to say to him, do you want to self-fund this? Because the law firm typically doesn't fund those out-of-pocket expenses. Mm. Occasionally, there are law firms that will mm -hmm. do it. Occasionally, our law firm will do it. But when it's a big budget case and you're really mm -hmm. probably talking at least a million dollars mm -hmm. of expense, you say you probably need to get a litigation funder unless you've got a lot of real estate or something else you can build a line of credit around and then you can control what checks get cut. Mm -hmm. You have to go to one of these outside lenders. So he said, I've talked to litigation lenders. They're too expensive. <laughs> I said, well, wait a minute, what's your alternative? Yeah. He said, well, my alternative is to convince you to find the money from resources you have, yeah. and I'll give you a bigger stake. And I said, my preference would be you use the litigation lender because there's only so much risk. Yeah. And the, the best movie to watch, if you want to watch a graphic example of this, is there's a movie that occurred 10, 15 years ago called The Civil Action. Oh, yeah. It was about a toxic yes. court class Great action. Movie. Yeah. Great movie. Great yeah. movie. And the guy's law firm is getting the yeah. Krugerrands out right. and saying, oh, we could sell the firm. Leveraging and, the property and, and, and the, everything. And, and the CEO of the company that's being sued, I think it was W.R. Grace, puts his feet up at the Harvard Club and says, don't bet your whole law firm on this. Oh, you're from Cornell? I thought you were from Harvard. <laughs> Don't bet your whole law firm. It's a funny scene with John Travolta where he says, I'm not from Harvard. I'm from Cornell. And he looks at him like, oh, gosh, you, I guess you are going to bet your whole law firm. And this is such an idiot. But there wasn't really litigation lending back yeah. in those days because that's a movie that tells a story from right. like the 1970s yeah. about a big toxic tort. Today, there would be litigation lenders that would get behind that kind of lawsuit expecting there to be mm. a big recovery mm. and expecting them to share in it. So when you have a $100 million case and you need a million dollars just to use round numbers, it shouldn't be that hard to peel off. We may pay 7%. We may pay these guys yeah. 7 million. Now, that sounds very lucrative and maybe even arguably usurious. Mm -hmm. But what alternative do you have? So, so the potential client would engage with these guys, yes, and they so, would say, "Okay, so, here's here's a certain amount of money at this interest rate." And, right. Okay. So we're pointing to a book here. I'll just yeah, cover the right. thing. There's a book that's now been created called Litigation Funding. I'll just point it to the camera. And the reason for this book is they actually assembled what the law is throughout the world oh, on litigation lending. So they're covering Hong Kong litigation. They're covering England and Wales, which is usually unheard of because England's been very traditional about not allowing this. They're covering Brazil, Bermuda, Austria, you know, the whole set mm. of countries from mm -hmm. A, A to Z, including the United States. And their view is it is a legitimate asset class. Mm. The lawsuit itself Wow. is an asset class, wow. and a portfolio of lawsuits is like a portfolio yeah. of assets in the class. So think about that. Yeah. In law school, we never talked about this. It was almost viewed as, <laughs> that's crazy. Why would we want yeah, to right. start? Would you... So yes, there's engagement directly with the client, with the client. and with the and law firm. And the law firm, firm too. Okay. It's a triangle. It's right. the reverse of insurance. Yeah. Think of it as instead of defending the case, right. it's You're helping funding it. fund the case. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick break. Before we do that, Jack, if you could remind sure. our listeners uh, about your firm, where yes. to reach you, if they need some help, or if they want to inquire. Right. So it's Jack Russo. We're at Computer Law Group in downtown Palo Alto, 650-327-9800. You could reach me most simply by email, jack at computerlaw.com, or jrusso, J-R-U-S-S-O, -S -S at computerlaw.com, 650-327-9800. And we see people all the time with cases that often they wonder, mm -hmm. can this get filed and right. can it get funded? And these days, it isn't just do you have the claim. It is 
do you have a way to fund it because litigation is costly and yeah. it is about persistence. Yeah, it is. All right, we're going to take a quick break. This is Joe Kucher with Real Estate Radio Live, sitting alongside Jack Russo. We're talking about uh, funding litigation today on our ongoing series of Starting Something in Silicon Valley. We'll be back with you in just a minute. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. How would you like the opportunity to secure a record low interest rate while buying and or selling your home? In addition, how would you like to save 20% or more on your entire real estate transaction? Finally, how would you like to bundle all your real estate services in one location? Well, now you can achieve this with BundleSelect.com. That's right, save on real estate lending and title. With BundleSelect.com, technology and a personal concierge are at your service to save you time and money. Bundle Select's hand-picked team of experts will save you thousands of dollars by bundling real estate lending and title services. BundleSelect.com gives you all the control, including using your own realtor. I'm Joe Cachero with Real Estate Radio Live, and I have been on the radio educating consumers for years. I'm here to tell you BundleSelect.com is the best way to save money on real estate. By bundling services, you could save tens of thousands of dollars. Visit BundleSelect.com. The estimated minimum savings are based on a comparison with the national average. Individual results may vary, and the estimated savings are not guaranteed. Bundle Select Inc. is a licensed real estate broker. California Bureau of Real Estate Broker License Number 00466902. Welcome back to Real Estate Radio Live. For more information on today's topic or guests, just visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Again, your host for today's edition of Real Estate Radio Live, Joe Kuchera. Welcome back in. Joe Kuchera with Real Estate Radio Live. Uh, we come to you, uh, try to anyway, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, right around 3 o'clock or so Pacific Standard Time. We'll continue to bring these different series to you. We do this ongoing series with Jack Russo uh, with the Computer Law Group. Try to do it once a week if we can, depending on everybody's schedule, uh, starting something in Silicon Valley. Today's topic is funding litigation. We've taken you through a series of these. So I would suggest if you're just picking this up now or maybe you're going through these podcasts, you're hearing this show that Jack and I do, do yourself a favor and go back and listen to, if you can, obviously if you have the time, or over the next several weeks, listen to the series from the start if you can, because I think then we put the pieces together as a puzzle a little bit better, Jack does, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish here. And we'll continue the series as well. Again, funding, litigation we're talking about today. Jack was in the first segment talking a little bit about this was never heard of. This wouldn't even be a topic of conversation well, well, 30, 40 well, years ago. Well, right? years ago it was viewed as against the law. Right. It was v- literally viewed as oh. unethical for a lawyer or law firm to get any third party to influence the case. So mm-hmm. influence is a very broad notion, but anyone coming in with money, almost like it's a sport to bet on a case, was viewed as illegal mm-hmm. and unethical. And in some states, still in the United States, there is an open question about whether funding will actually be approved by a court if a court faces a challenge to it, because the historical law took the view, and I believe it was called champerty and barratry and you know solicitation, and essentially they didn't want people to stir up more lawsuits I by see. saying, oh, I you got a great case. I see. I'll help you fund it. Well, we all knew that the rich aunt and the rich uncle were doing that stuff all the time. Right. They were saying as to a family member, you're getting taken advantage of by whoever. I'll, I'll stake you the money. Do it. And no one said that was illegal or unethical. They just said family members want to support mm-hmm. their other family right. member. Then what happened over time, and it really started, I want to say, in the area of patents in the U.S., where people who are the small folks owning patents, they couldn't really get justice on their patents. And there were people that were saying, well, look, there's nothing illegal about starting a company and putting the patents in a company, typically Mm -hmm. an LLC. There's nothing illegal about having that LLC raise money from investors. Mm -hmm. Those investors are providing support for, quote, a licensing program on those patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, intellectual property, whatever it is. And if someone's infringing, well, that LLC should file suit. And mm-hmm. the courts were like, that sounds right. That doesn't sound illegal. And then where it went from there was a number of really smart financial people saying, mainly to fairly wealthy 
investors that wanted some diversification. Hey, why do you have to be in stocks and bonds? Why do you have to be in oil and gas? Mm. Why do you have to be in real estate? We have these LLCs that we will help you participate in as an asset class. And about 10 years ago, they started going on the road and saying, this is the new asset class. Because so they're raising funds to do it. They're raising this. funds yeah. to do it. So they <laughs> essentially said, we are like a venture firm. Mm, yeah. The venture, instead of being a startup company, is essentially a litigation or sometimes a collection of litigation. So all of this privacy, GDPR mm -hmm. litigation that's now emerged, a lot of it is being mm -hmm. financed by outside sources because the other thing that happened, which was sort of an interesting part of this, and it surprised me even, is law firms are starting to say, well, we don't even want 33% of the case. If you give us a monthly retainer, not the full fee that we're right. billing, but like maybe 25%, 50%, we'll lower our percentage stake mm. and give you that in exchange. So it was like the arbitrage by the yeah. law firm who was saying, look, our associates want to be paid top dollar in salary. They're not mm -hmm. willing to take annual bonuses that depend on the outcome of a right, lawsuit. Right. So we'll arbitrage percentages. Mm -hmm. Now that was another game changer because it enabled these funds mm. to actually treat the law firm as the client, where the law firm was, hey, you're already taking contingent fee cases. Now if you talk to the folks that do big contingent fee work, they kind of laugh like, why do you even have to go to these guys? They're so rapacious. They ask for so much percentage. Just go to your local commercial bank and tell them you've got this great practice. You've been doing it for nearly 40 years. They'll give you a line of credit, and you'll just pay the line of credit at whatever the rate is, 4%, 5%, mm -hmm. and fund the cases yourself. Well, the problem is a lot of law firms, particularly small law firms, they don't want to take that liability. Yeah, blame, yeah. And so it <clears throat> opens the door for non-traditional funding. Now, yeah. the big law firms are out there that have big lines of credit. You know, Some of them, of course, crashed as a result of mm -hmm. using these lines of yeah. credit and failing. Because remember, you can invest a lot in a case. I mean, recently I saw the data. It just about shocked me. Two pieces of data. Data number one, the median cost for trying a patent case through appeal is over four million. Oh four million gosh. dollars of professional service time and typically over a million of one cost, patent case. One patent case. One appeal. All so right? when this guy says I got a list of a hundred patents it's a lot of cases and, yeah. a, and a list of ten defendants. Yeah. Wow. So so a lot of cases. Now of wow. course you're hoping for a domino effect sure. where you win one sure. case. Of course these guys would salivate at that because they get a percentage on every domino just yeah. like the law firm would. Mm -hmm. So they salivate on, hey, if you win the first one, then it has a drafting effect on all the rest. and okay. everyone. It's like has an effect down the road, and so that's great, and there's very little risk. But you got to win that one mm -hmm. case, right? Mm -hmm. So the point I'm making about this is there are opportunities, but it's so expensive. And the second thing that's so expensive is the amount of work that people put in when they've got a big set of cases beyond just that number on the patent case. I saw a class action case where the lawyers had the right to request fees be awarded for winning this class action cybersecurity breach case that was in the news. And I was shocked that they put in like 90,000 hours between wow. five different law firms over like a four-year period. Mm -hmm. I was like, that case probably should have been a 50-hour trial. How did it become wow. 90,000? And the judge granted them the fees. I mean, I may be overstating what the totals were. There were big numbers, and the fees were big numbers. I want to say that the recovery for the class, <clears throat> which was a settlement, not a trial, was something like $125 million. Yeah. The lawyers were getting like $27 million of it, wow. and it was covering a lot of hours. And I said mm -hmm. to myself, gosh, shouldn't that case have just gone in some sort of mini-trial way to get to a resolution? Right. Why this gigantic congressional hearing over what was a pretty clear cyber breach. Mm -hmm. Maybe there were arguments about the damages and the numbers, but it just seemed amazing to me. And, you know, the system really needs to reform itself. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if litigation funding is helping that or hurting that, because to some degree, you could argue it spurs mm -hmm. on turning every rock over, not getting to the heart of things, looking at every little footnote, mm -hmm. every little detail. But that's kind of the way a lot of litigation yeah. is these days. Are there are there some reputable 
companies have been doing this long enough. Yes. They have some data and statistics. Yes. Yes. They, could, they could show you, right? They, this is what we've done the last 20 it's years. It's gotten to the point, and it started in Australia, that there are even now public companies that report publicly wow. on the number of cases. So in Australia, I want to say there's one, two, or three literally public companies that their business is lending to yeah. law firms for wow. litigation. And they literally publish their quarterly numbers, and the quarterly numbers show the number of cases they're funding, <laughs> the average of what... So it's interesting data. <laughs> Should that concern us that we're developing a whole new series? Well, I mean, it's, it's amazing. amazing. It's a scary thing because if you're Facebook and you take one false move, That's or a good point. Tesla, That's you a take good a point. false move. When you have the deep pockets, right? You're going to yeah, see, you're gonna right. see something happen. Right. I mean, in Tesla's case, two days after that tweet, about 420, right. uh, funding secured, boom, class action, I think three already, like within a week, three class action cases. Those are all, no doubt, being litigation funded, whether by the law firm, outside wow. funders, or some combination. And if you read the book, and we've got the book here, it's my only copy, but for those who are interested, I'm sure I can get the electronic version if they email me. It literally goes through jurisdiction by jurisdiction, mm -hmm. who's doing work in the jurisdiction, and what are they typically funding. So there's some smaller guys that are funding like 100,000 here, 100,000 there. And there are bigger guys that are looking for really big cases mm -hmm. where they want to fund like 5 million at a time. They want to manage it like it's a big investment. Yeah. So they're looking for the big, gigantic class action case or the big, gigantic IP case, and they really want to get their arms over around it. So this is another alternative solution for people. You, you gave the example, the guy from the East Coast that potentially thinks he's got the rights on these patents and it's they're being infringed upon. This is... This is an option this is in an, some cases. This is an option, and it's got pros and cons because right. to some degree, just like taking an investor, you're taking in a new partner. Mm -hmm. They're going to want to have some input on what you're doing. They're going to want to have some influence over, do you settle? Do you try the case? They want to know kind of are you really being accurate with your lawyers? Mm -hmm. Are you being accurate and complete with them? Mm -hmm. They do due diligence on the case. So sometimes I say to clients where I say, look, you have a case, I think it's got some challenges, but don't just take my word for it. Why don't we bring in a litigation funder? We'll spend an afternoon with them. Let's hear whether they would give that you funding. That makes sense. It's like due diligence. No, like that, that makes due, sense. It's like right. free due diligence. Right. Now, sometimes the funder will say, I don't even want to talk to them about the case. It's not big enough. Right. If you don't tell me the number is at least as big. Right. Now, often the funder, because it's got the problem of there's a lot of people that are pitching stuff at mm -hmm. them. and most of it may not be 100% as good as the way people are selling their case. Right. So they're looking for lawyers that help screen. So they want lawyers that aren't going to waste right. their time, right? Are there a percentage of litigation, lawsuits, whether it's patents? Whatever? In other words, my point is, do you see a high level of something? In other words, that they'd be more apt to come after, are they looking for it? Does that make sense? So these guys that fund... Yes. Are they saying, you know, 30% of what we fund are patent litigation things? In other words, are there targets yes, for them? Yes. In fact, you could say the whole industry is starting to specialize and differentiate. So there's uh -huh. actually firms that have gone off mainly towards IP and okay. mainly towards bigger cases. There's other firms that have gone off in the direction of commercial, smaller funding mm -hmm, cases. Mm -hmm. There are some that have gone off on class action and like cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part of this, and this might be questionable, but it's true. They attach to the firm experts, almost like venture firms, deep benches in areas where they know mm. what is it going to take to win the case? Mm. What is it? What kind of expert do you need? They actually provide support that goes beyond the money, a little bit like a venture firm. Hey, we know this area. Mm -hmm. We know how businesses can grow in this area. We know mm -hmm. how to reach customers or how to reach an audience in this area. We know how to do some jury testing in this area. So there's a good wow. show on TV called Bull that is this <laughs> jury expert. I don't know why his name is Bull. Maybe that's a double entendre. But he does this research, and it's a good it's a good video to watch or a good TV show to mm -hmm. watch because he always has a different story that he's trying to test to see yeah. which way a jury is going to go. And they do some of this. Some hmm. of this they'll try to simulate do we really have a $100 million case here, or do mm. we really just have a $100,000 case? Because what they want, take the IP example, the domino effect. If you've got 20 defendants and you win the first or second case, mm -hmm. do the other 18 all fall in line? Yeah. 
Is there like a domino effect? Because that's like a uh, multiplier. I had, no, a big, I had no idea this existed. This is big, interesting. It's a big, yeah, I can see big, it now. It's a big recent thing. And, yeah. the, and the part that surprised people, and it's really the most recent aspect, big law firms that have up to this point pushed these guys away uh-huh. are starting to embrace them. Well, why would big, they do that because, now? Because big law firms are saying to themselves, we don't want to take the risk of the line of so credit. So less exposure. We want to reduce our exposure. Yeah. We think it's an asset if we're able to say we've got a relationship with a okay. litigation funder. It's uh-huh. a differentiator. And we can essentially lever lines of credit that mm-hmm. our bank might not give us because the bank might look mm-hmm. at our receivables mm-hmm. and you know our expenses and our mm-hmm. office lease. This is an alternative lender mm-hmm. that's doing project-based lending right. based on the quality of the yeah. case. The third thing is once you get the lender in the mix, and this is controversial, but typically the client has to get the lender's approval to change the law mm-hmm. firm so it creates yeah. lock-in effect okay. for the big law firm to say, well, the client can't get rid of yeah. us. You know, if they li- dislike yeah. us, which sometimes happens. There's an ethical yeah. issue there, and there are definitely yeah. controversies so about it. We have just a couple minutes. So one thing that comes to mind here as we close out, Jack, is so – let me see if I could articulate this correctly. So does does the judge, if it goes to trial or a case, is the judge fully aware of all the background of this? Not. I mean, look, the judges are generally becoming aware that these folks are in the background. They don't necessarily have knowledge. And a big controversy that I think up to now has been solved, but mm-hmm. historically it's been a controversy. If the other side finds out you got a litigation yeah. lender, what stops them from serving a subpoena on the lender and getting That's access was, to all right. that information? Right. The courts have recently said the lender is like almost an expert witness, okay. consulting expert. That's work product. Hands off. Hands off. Okay. That has essentially control group, attorney, work product, attorney, okay. client, protected information. You shouldn't be able to pierce into your adversary's thought process by saying, well, they talked to a lender. Let's find out what they so, said. So a judge wouldn't necessarily be partial one way or another or something like this. Well, if he or she knew it. I think there are judges that still are very traditional. Uh-huh. Like litigation lender, man, what are we Throw doing? Throw a red flag like, to them? Like, what is this, a roulette wheel? Yeah, right. court? I mean, there right. are people, there's still... <laughs> That's some what judges. I was wondering. There's still some judges like that, but the modern judges... <laughs> okay. And recently, there was even a video by a federal judge, a very well-regarded federal judge, who recently retired and became a consultant to one of these litigation lenders wow. as a retired judge, helping to screen cases. And he went on YouTube. Not a bad deal. It was interesting. He yeah. went on YouTube, and it just about made people fall, because they always thought, oh, he's a really conservative judge. He never said it. He said, there's a reality in the marketplace. Of course there's going to be litigation lending, because how else do these cases go to trial? They can't go to trial without some uh. funding. And he was just, just put it straight <laughs> out there. And most people who watched that video said, wow. It's not the guy I knew. It's not the guy I <laughs> I knew. I thought he'd be against this. But, you know, really smart, great judge. He actually is a mediator as well. I'll leave his name out because he doesn't like publicity. But if you went on YouTube, you'd find him. And he tells a story about this is a natural evolution of what's happened to our yeah. legal system. It's mm-hmm. just too expensive. And, of course, every year there is a big ABA conference about we've got to drive costs down. We've got to do this. We've mm-hmm. got to do that. And up to this point, it hasn't happened. Now, whether the Internet and AI and other things, big data that are happening that might provide some additional ways to break the log jam of expense makes that change happen. Yeah. I don't know. I'm in favor of it. You've mm-hmm. heard me several times say this is not a case that should cost right. this much money. But unfortunately, there are a lot of tools that opposing lawyers have all the time to play mm-hmm. cards in lots of different ways that in many ways drive up yeah. expense, and that becomes a challenge. All right. Well, I've got to wrap up. Again, if someone wants to get a hold of you, they want more information about litigation, funding litigation, or anything else, right? how do they reach you? It's Jack Russo, Computer Law Group in Palo Alto, near the Apple Store in downtown Palo Alto, 650-327-9800, jrusso at computerlaw.com. I will remark, too, that it's not just litigation. It's also really arbitration, Mm. international disputes. Sometimes it's even just funding Mm. the negotiation of the resolution of the dispute in mediation, which Mm. is unheard of that Mm. you would get funding for that. But literally, you got to pay sometimes experts to go to that mediation. So the funders are very open 
It may not even be a litigation yet. They're very open to hearing about what the opportunity yeah. is. And it does provide a means for justice to folks yeah. that might otherwise be foreclosed from using the legal system. All so right. in that sense, there's some goodness here for sure. I learned a lot today. Good. I just hope, well, I I hope these others like did. That. I, I did. thought you'd like that. <laughs> Since um, I am the business of funding, too, that's interesting. Well, it's, it's, it's expanding <laughs> daily. It's yes, amazing it what's out there. All right, this is Joe Kachira sitting alongside Jack Russo. Jack, thanks again for the time. Well, thanks. Great we'll see what our experiment does yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a look at that iPhone when we're done. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks, Joe. Take thanks care. We'll tell you with the next time. You've been listening to Real Estate Radio Live. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Subscribe to our podcast. Discover more at reradiolive.com.